Hi, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us today uh, on this beautiful uh, day. Um, today's webinar is entitled Student Reflections on Ending Gender-Based Violence. And, and this is in honor of Moosehide Campaign Day. And um, Moosehide Campaign um, is an organization through which Sprottshot College um, is affiliated with. We are actually an ambassador campus. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that and what that means in a little bit. Um, but I do welcome um, everyone to, to share their land acknowledgements into the chat if um, that's a good way to test whether the chat is working. Um, I personally am zooming in from the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Skohomish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and, and I thought I'd just share a, a quick story. Um, so we're we're having our house painted and we chose the colors um, in the, the depths of winter when, you know, things were kind of colorless and a little bit bleak and um and we have this dark blue really dark house and i thought you know we really need to brighten this up um and when i looked at all the online um discussion forums about like choosing paint colors for for houses they said you know look around to see like what inspires you make sure that it fits into the landscape and and whatnot and so i thought well okay i'll i'll, I'll have a look and and i thought you know i do want to brighten this up a little bit it feels a little bit dark and dreary and and so i and i, I really like the blues and greens you know of this this territory and so I chose something that's that's a little bit brighter and um and when when they ended up painting it it's like so bright <laughs> it's like a teal actually um it's it's really quite bright and and I came home one day when after the first coat went on I thought oh my gosh what I've done it looks like the the Joker from Batman has um, <laughs> painted my house. And so, um, so I was feeling like, really, this is a blight on the land of the people here. Like, this doesn't fit in with the landscape at all. Like, what have I done? Um, and then this weekend, I went to the um, Mother's Day powwow um, at Trout Lake uh, Community Center, which is right next to me. Um, and all I saw were beautiful bright, vibrant, wonderful colors um, in celebration of, you know, what what is out there. These colors are all over nature and there are so many different shades and different, different vibrant colors. And um and and it was it was really good reminder that even though I, I definitely stick out on the block, <laughs> um but I don't stick out, stick out in spirit in this, in this, in celebrating cheerfulness and celebrating brightness. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share that with everybody. So today um, we are talking um, about something that um, uh, many of us maybe uh, um, know a little bit or know a lot about, um, which is uh, gender-based violence. Um, and the, the Moosehide campaign um, was uh, started originally um, as a way to talk about the missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, but is also uh, committed to not only Indigenous um, uh, girls and women um, and, and two-spirited individuals, um, but really creating a safer space um, uh, for, for everybody, um, ending sexual assaults, ending gender-based violence of all kinds. Um, and so uh, the, this is something that um, we at Sprachar are also very committed to. And um, we know that this is something that affects um, people, uh, unfortunately, um, in our communities. And um, many of us have uh, experienced um, the direct impacts of gender-based violence and witnessed the harmful impacts um, on the many client populations um, that we serve uh, as well. And so participating in Moose High Campaign um, is really benefiting everybody in our community where we're located, our institution, um, the individuals we serve um, by encouraging and empowering people um, to discuss violence against uh, women and children um, and provide uh, uh, accessible avenues to stand up and take action in an effort to end this violence. Um, so many of you who are on campuses um, uh, that um, uh, have received uh, moose high pins, in case anybody is wondering, this is kind of, oh, no, it's kind of, I think I went out of focus there, <laughs> but um, but there's like a little moose hide pin here that um, many of us are wearing uh, this week, and so you're welcome to wear it any time um, throughout the year uh, to show your support of of moose hide campaign. They are actually made of um, of real moose hide. Um, so uh, so with that, we thought that one of the ways that we can um, really honor uh, the 
the spirit of Sprottshaw College in um, learning, supporting education, um, in thinking about our communities that we serve um, is to invite our students actually to provide their voices on this very important topic. Um, and, and I am thrilled that we have three student participants, two of whom are gonna, um, you're going to hear from uh, live today. Um, and the first one um, is Wadeen uh, Burnett. And uh, the first thing to know about Wadeen is that um, she is a child of God. Um, Wadeen was called to become a counselor and is completing the mental health and addictions care worker program as part of her counseling degree at Columbia Bible College. Um, her instructors um, say Wadeen is just so passionate about her work um, and she believes she has a calling from her creator and she takes it seriously by infusing her interactions with, with joy and happiness and she is one of the most positive people you will ever meet. Um, so, Wadeen, I invite you to um, take the floor uh, and uh, unmute yourself so that you can um, uh, chat with uh, everybody. Thank you. Thank you again. And hello, everyone. I thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it for granted. I thank God, first and foremost. I thank Scott Shaw College and my instructors. And I just thank the entire team and the partners and all that made this possible. Today, we're gonna to speak on this topic that is, is very delicate. And you will hear me speak about God because as she mentioned, I am a child of God. And um, we'll be speaking briefly about it. It's, it's not easy, but I just want you to know that although it's a, it's a very delicate topic, I want, you, I want you to know that, you know, I feel your pain and I'm deeply sorry for what you've been through and what you're going through. I wanna say that I love you, I believe in you, and I trust that whatever decision you make going forward for yourself and your family will be the right one. I also want you to know that you are a royal priesthood. I want you to know your worth, know that God loves you. And I do hope that this contribution will inspire you and encourage you and also educate you. There are certain things that I've learned and some things that I've seen and um, domestic violence, it is so dangerous. It, it caused trauma and it can even cause death. There were instances where an individual mentioned that she was leaving and she lost her life. There was another individual that went through the trauma, the physical abuse, the emotional abuse, and she had to leave slowly and exit migrated just to get away from it silently. So these things affect not only the individual, but it also affects children in the long term. So communication is very important because a lot of times we may think that the children don't know, but children actually they hear and they see everything. So it's very important that we understand that the trauma doesn't only affect the individual, but also their offsprings. These things make you feel hopeless, helpless, unappreciated, unloved. And at the end of it, the individual wants you to make yourself available for intimacy. It is not good. It, it is very sad. It is heartbreaking to know that we have to go through these things. Another way how it can make you feel bad about yourself, feel like a slave, want to be away from your friends and your family, feel controlled or feel unappreciated. And these things, because it takes control of you and it holds you back, it actually isolates you from people. And we were created for community to be together, to be able to help each other, to stand firm, to have a friend. The Bible said a friend is closer than a brother. And many times when individuals are going through this, they don't speak or they'll say, I'm okay. And they'll just, you know, just smile and pretend as if everything is okay. But it's okay to speak. It's okay to have a friend that understands you. And it's okay to know that you don't deserve what you're going through. So, so as I said before, some of the things that you need, you need a friend. It is essential in all seasons of your life to have a friend to speak to. Most importantly, you need to pray and acknowledge God 
and for ask him to help you to keep you in your right mind because this is traumatic it can affect your mental health so i'll tell you this like as a ppe you need to pray you need to plan and you need to execute pray and and you know plan your way have strategic plans how you plan to do things or you plan to go about things and make sure that whatever you do and however you do it you are safe while doing it and when you execute you know that you cannot do this on your own but with others and by the grace of god you will be okay self-care i have to stress this because self-care is very very important you have to know who you are and what you want in a relationship and also before going in or if you're even in or, or in or out you must speak about what you want from what you don't want into it another thing we may work too much or overwork ourselves because we have to do all the work and you know even though you feel unappreciated you have to do it you don't take any time for yourself you don't take any time to rest you have to take that me time that time where you know that i have to relax myself I have to take care of me because even in the plane, they tell you that when they drop the oxygen mask, you put it on yourself first before you even put it on your child. So you have to take care of you. You have to be strong for yourself and also for your child. Take a walk if you have to. Listen to music. You know, eat healthy. Take care of you and know your worth. Know that you are beautiful. You're wonderful and you are a royal police. You have to have a safety plan. And some of the things that they mention in a safety plan is whether you're in or out, you have to know how to do things discreetly because this is a situation where it's very dangerous. What you have to think, what can I do to be able to be self-sufficient? Because most of the time when individuals take control, they, they take away your independence and leave you to be um, rely on them for your every need. So what can I do? If you are not independent, or can I do this? You have to talk to yourself. Every situation is different. So you have to know which, where you are in it and what you can relate to. What will I do? I'll save $20 out of $100 or I'll save $5. I'll try my best to save something. What about your documents? Are they in place? Are they out of the house, do you have an emergency bag? If you have to make a move, you can take that bag. Are your documents in place where you know where they are? Or do you have to send them away somewhere before you go? These are things that you have to think about and you have to plan because women are very smart. And once you get a chance to think and plan, you can think your way through any situation. Your emergency bag with your medication and stuff is very important. If you have to call 911, you please do so for your own safety. And remember that your safety comes first. There are also other things that you can do, doing things to the glory of God. It takes back the control and it also gives you joy. If you are cleaning, normally you clean because, oh, I have to clean before there's a problem. If you clean, just do it because God says cleanliness is godliness. Take, shift, shift the control away from the individual. Do it because cleanliness is godliness. You're doing it for God. And that makes you feel better. If you're cooking, cook because God wants you to take care of yourself and your family. The family that he entrusted you with, he want you to take care of them so you have to prepare meals and make sure they stay healthy. Adorn yourself. When you put your clothes on, when you put your, your makeup on, when you put your hair on, when you do your hair, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. You will feel better about yourself knowing that I'm doing this because... I know that God want me. This is what the Lord want for me. He want me to look good, to feel good, and to be the best version of myself. And this will keep you in your right mind. It will keep you stable. In our society now, in our community, mental health is under a rise. And it's important to know that self-care is essential. Work. Work because work is a mandate from God. And love because God is love. 
So these are things that you think about and know how to go about these things. There's another thing that I'll also want to say is be strong, be resilient. Yes, you've been through a lot. And a lot of times you feel like it's the end of the world. No, I can't go through anymore. I don't feel like going on. I don't know what to do. You have to bounce back. You have to be like a palm tree. What is a palm tree? A palm tree is that tree that looks like a coconut tree where in storms, it bounces back, it blows, it bends, but guess what? It's not broken. It, it pushed through and stand through the storm. You have to be that resilient person to know that no matter the situation, no matter what you've been through, you can bounce back. You can be the best version of yourself. You can be anything that you want to be in life. And you have to speak to yourself and you have to, you have to believe it, not just speak it, but you have to speak it and you have to believe it. And you have to have, you need that friend that can speak into your life, that support, that community where they, 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 they understand you, they want what's best for you. And someone that will say to you, if you wanna give up, no, that's wrong. You can't give up, you have to go on. Not someone that will help you to give up. No, you need that strong source behind you to help you move forward because greatness is in you. And you have to always remember that there is greatness in you. So today I just wanna thank you for this opportunity. And I do hope that my contribution would make a difference in your life. And I thank you for listening. And I just want to let you know that God loves you. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Vadine. Um, really appreciate, uh, again, so much of your passion and your words um, today. Um, uh, we will be hearing from uh, Lisa Butler next. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Lisa could not be with us um, today. Um, she, she has a conflict, um, but she did send us a recording um, to, to share. And uh, her instructors say this about Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a CSWSS student who practices helpfulness and generosity with her classmates and teacher. Um, she's a natural leader. Um, she is always willing to assist and has started working in the field of addiction recovery where she uh, is certain to excel. Uh, we're very grateful to her for her willingness um, to share this um, this project um, that she has worked on. And uh, in what um, she's actually going to be talking about is um, a, a leader in this field um, of indigenous rights and um, and and an advocate uh, for women and children. Um, and and her name is Cindy Blackstock. So um, let us uh, have a recording of her. Let me just share share the screen here. Hello, my name is Lisa Butler, and I am a student in the Penticton campus of Sprott Shaw. Victoria Lane is my instructor, and I'm taking the community support worker slash uh, social services. I'm sorry that I cannot be here um, for the actual meeting, uh, but I did actually get employment at a treatment center. Um, I come with lived experience, and that wouldn't have been possible without my course. So I'm very thankful to have that job, but I am working 3 to 11. So unfortunately, um, I just had to record this and send it in. This presentation was done during our course uh, CS301, which is Professional Skills for Fieldwork in Canada. And our project was to pick a woman in history uh, that inspires you. So my choice was Cindy Blackstock. She continues to inspire me. I actually hadn't uh, heard of her before this course and before learning about Indigenous studies. And she is someone who I'm actively learning from. Um, I'm looking for information, I'm seeking her out in videos and just information that she has, and I find her so inspiring and I would encourage you to do the same. So I've included a few quotes um, from herself, as well as what other people have uh, said to her, because I do think that it points out kind of who she is at base and how she's perceived by, by um, people. So the first one here is justice is something that should be accessible to everyone, not just the privileged. A little bit about Dr. Cindy Blackstock. She was born in 1964 um, in Burns Lake, BC, Canada. 
Her education, she has a Bachelor of Arts from UBC, two master degrees from McGill, a PhD in social work from the University of Toronto. Her occupation is social worker and academic activist. And she started the organization First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. She has won over 50 awards. Um, here she is accepting a 2003 World's Children Prize um, in Sweden. And in this picture here, she's receiving an award uh, from the University of Toronto president and she received a Doctor of Laws. So one uh, NDP Indigenous Affairs uh, actually said about Cindy is she is Canada's Martha, Martin Luther King at this moment for Indigenous children, a relentless moral voice holding government to account. Uh, she's created Have a Heart Day, which is a part of her foundation. Uh, the youth, the annual youth led event is a project of First Nations Family and Caring Society. Paul Martin, former prime minister, said, I believe Cindy Blackstock represents so much of what good, what's good about Canada. Another quote she said that really spoke to me said, with every generation of children comes a chance to create a Canada anew, a chance to create a First Nations community anew, one that represents the ancestors dreams of that community. Uh, Jordan's principle, if you don't know what Jordan's principle is, I strongly encourage you to look that up um, and get some information. It is a sad, sad story and hopefully um, using his death as um, in good, hopefully it will stop other children from having to face the same fate he did. Uh, Jordan was a beautiful child born with um, issues physically and medically and he was in the hospital because our governments uh, couldn't figure out who paid for what uh, when they did decide that Jordan could live in a foster home um, outside of the hospital kind of for his last years or months. The fight lasted so long that poor Jordan ended up dying in hospital um, and it just shows the unfairness um, that the Indigenous children face. So this principle is something that Cindy Blackstock um, is an active activist about and holds the government liable. The blanket here you see her with um, is actually Jordan's blanket and I know she holds that near and dear to her and it means a lot and it was given to her by the family. Uh, who is Dr. Cindy Blackstock? You could actually see her up here, a part of the um, activist movement, so she doesn't just talk the talk, she walks the walk, which is another thing that I just deeply inspire her for. Uh, she's been a trusted champion of First Nations children's rights for over a decade, demanding justice and advancing culturally based equitable solutions. She's creating a totally different decolonized mindset that values true equality of funding, education and services for all kids without exception. Another great quote she has is don't just publish another paper. Let's do something, which I absolutely loved. Uh, the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, they've got a website, uh, so if you want to just Google that, I would strongly encourage you to look into this. There's a lot of information and resources. Uh, one of them for reconciliation and action, she's got Orange Shirt Day, Have a Heart Day, Bear Witness Day, and then of course more information about Jordan's Principle. Spirit Bear and Friends is a great concept. Um, it's about a spirit bear that goes and does everyday things and learns about his culture, his language, fishing, schooling. Um, and by children reading the books, they get to learn as well. And they get to see someone doing something that represents them. Um, they get to open a book and see an Indigenous um, teaching. I see an Indigenous bear learning Indigenous things. Um, I'm 41 and I've learned from these books, so they are a great, great resource and very beautifully done with great illustrations. Uh, big win for kids. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has issued 23 procedural and non-compliance orders since 2016 landmark ruling, three of which were issued in 2021 and 2022. Again, the website has more information on that. These are examples of the books that uh, she has um, authored and then it was illustrated by Amanda Strong. Great illustrations, great books. Again, they are for children, um, but like I said, I've learned from them um, and I just think they're, it's such a great concept and I think it's helping children. She also has a Spirit Bear podcast. Uh, she isn't in every episode, but she does feature a lot of them. So if you want to go on that website and check out the Spirit Bear podcast, there is a short description of each um, podcast to see which one she is speaking in and I would strongly suggest that you um, listen to one, share it, 
Um, and you'll learn about her if you don't really know much about her either, like I didn't, um, and hopefully you'll find her just as inspiring as I do. Um, she's the professional of social work at McGill University. She was asked um, a lot of questions actually in one article, and I just picked two because I loved the question and I just loved her answers. So this just kind of gives you a little bit more of a personal insight about who Cindy Blackstock is and what she believes in. So uh, she was asked, what has been the most rewarding part of your career? And her answer was first, seeing the hearing rooms for the human rights case full of children and youth of all backgrounds. Second is seeing First Nations children, youth and families finally getting get something closer to equitable services. The second question I really liked was, what is your hope for the next generation of children in this country? And her answer is, my hope is that First Nations children will never have to grow up recovering from their childhoods and non-Indigenous children will never have to say they are sorry. That First Nations children can dream of growing up to be an astronaut, a doctor, a teacher, a dancer, a carpenter, a knowledge keeper or journalist instead of just dreaming about getting a clean glass of water or a school without black mold. Um, and then I just have listed some of my citations. Uh, so that is the end of the presentation. Um, again, I'm sorry that I can't be there uh, in person, but like I said, I've been blessed with a job because of Sprout Shop and because of the education I've uh, received here. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much. And so we can see the connections already there um, between uh, uh, Lisa's presentation on Cindy Blackstock, where um, she emphasizes um, children um, as as the really as oftentimes um, the victims of of unfortunate circumstances. And um, Wadeen also talked beautifully about how children need to be consideration in um, uh, our actions as well. Um, and I am pleased to introduce uh, our, our last um, panelist today, um, Alex Knight. Um, Alex Knight was a chef for 25 years before shifting her career towards working with youth. Uh, Alex is a recent graduate of the Community Support Worker Program and is passionate about her new career serving youth. As a Métis youth worker, Alex joined Urban Native Youth Association, um, or ANYA for short, in February after her practice come with them and finds her new role uh, rewarding and healing and learning about her own roots as well as honoring the Indigenous youth she works with. Um, her instructors report that Alex has a lively personality. Um, she kept the class entertained with stories from her past. Uh, she's warm and caring and goes out of her way to support people, not only in those, those in the classroom, but in her community as well. So I will turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, thank you. I'm so grateful to be able to share the space with everyone today, uh, the contributors, and, and really being honored to be able to um, be considered for this. Um, and so I am very grateful for the training that I've received. And it's created such a wonderful foundation for, for the youth and the community that I am working in uh, with Urban Native uh, Youth Association. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about my reflective. Um, I think that unfortunately, every day, the youth that I work with, anywhere between 13 to 18 year olds, and some of the other programs with Anya work with, you know, 11 to 22 year olds. Gender based violence is a daily occurrence for us, unfortunately. And so, um, which isn't unfortunately isn't news to, uh, to us, but I wanna really, you know, talk about the reflections since I've had my practicum, um, you know, and, and done my training. It has offered me such a beautiful foundation and um, I'm so grateful, grateful to have found Anya. It creates a different, it creates a little bit of a different foundation than what is kind of um, in the norm of residential treatment programs. Um, their particular program really focuses on meeting youth where they're at. The two I'm seeing philosophy, uh, which I am really grateful to have grasped in my own indigenous journey. Um, and so 
Anya, in all of their programs, we have the program that I'm involved in and two others, it really challenges that model of youth that are seeking substance abuse supports, that they are staying in the community, that we are literally surrounded by this program, by other programs, by the Native Friendship Center, um, that you know we're constantly being able to support them at where they're at. So whether that's me creating workshops, um, life skills, or being able to create something fun at the Friendship Center, like jean jacket making, and really, really being able to be in the community. One of the things that's unique about Anya, and I'm again, I can't say this enough times, I'm so grateful that I work here every day. I am so grateful that I get to work with my youth um, every day and my support team and my leadership. Um, one of the things that really, um, again, is, sorry, is working in the community, um, you know, is creating those workshops, creating spaces for youth to be able to meet them where they're at. Um, part of the bottle is not being completely removed. Um, it's not about abstinence. It's about teaching them the skills around substance um, and teaching them about harm reduction program and meeting them where they're at in a place of being able to focus on what they need today and knowing that every moment and every success is a success. Um, and unfortunately, I have witnessed it um, on a daily basis with some of my youth. We service both young men and women. Um, but really the connection to ceremonies that we have, the daily connections and cultural workshops that we have, um, Connecting to the Monday through Friday workshops and allowing them to return to the community, to returning to those supports, um, either that we've helped them create or we've helped them build or we've helped create that bridge. Um, you know, certainly some of our youth choose to stay here on the weekends and that's wonderful. Um, but yeah, it's it's really trying to challenge that of not following that regular model and having people be removed from community and out of sight, out of mind and being removed and, you know, get better and then return to community. And so we're really working with them on a day-to-day -day basis of, of, like I said, meeting them where they're at um, and really being able to daily challenge and, and advocate um, and really advocate for them for that. Um, the youth challenge me. The youth that I've had the, had the blessing to work with, they challenge me in my own in my own um, ideas and my own philosophies about uh, about my own cultural journey, um, and letting me know and share stories of some of the violence or some of the situations that they've been involved in. Um, and I think my reflection for this, you know, and speaking to my youth and really looking at my journey in the last, you know, three months since I've been here is really in order to heal this journey not just for our Indigenous youth, but to heal that journey with anyone in substance abuse is really connecting back to the youth and really connecting back to the community and really listening to those voices. I am sh I am not shocked. I'm kind of shocked and surprised every single day how some of my 14, 15, 16 year olds I have such a strong, amazing voice. I just go, whoa. Just like that at 15, 16. Wow. So it's always so inspiring and it's always so beautiful that they just 
advocate for themselves and they say exactly what they need. Not all youth are like that, but it's seeing that empowerment amongst each other and being able to create that safe space that really in inspires me and, and gives me hope um, every day and the tiniest little wins of, of uh, youth who are struggling with the substance. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, that's where I'm at with my reflections. And again, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you to the fellow speakers and, and yeah, this opportunity to really share that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And um, yeah, uh, again, I I hear the the themes coming through um, loud and clear um, of, of really uh, how how much youth are are affected um, by what's going on in their environment and how important it is to to really um, kind of see them for who they are. And um, we're going to move into the Q and A section here. And uh, with Dean and Alex, I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, in, in your experience. Um, I think working with um, clients and and the youth um, that you both uh, see, um, like what. What barriers do you see um, that your, the population that you work with um, put up for themselves? Um, because I feel like this is something that um, uh, you both have spoken a little bit about. There are certainly uh, barriers in their their past and in their environment um, that society has unfortunately put up for them. But I also um, hear you when you're saying that they're they're finding you know ways to cope or ways to do what um whatever they can to, to kind of get through it um and sometimes that actually means they're putting their own barriers in place perhaps to um it's a it's a self-defense me mechanism that they're like well if i don't try then i can't fail or I, I won't be disappointed and so i guess i'm I'm curious to see like what um what do, what is your experience with that and what kind of barriers do you see people put up I'll go ahead and start. Um, that's a great question. And I think that, I think that it's that belief that they can do it. And so I share a little bit about my own stories with my youth and just in regards to my own journey and really say, I'm almost 50 years old and I decided to change careers. And some days, even in class, I thought every single day, what am I doing? <laughs> this is just, wow, can I do this? And it is, it's those celebrating those little tiny wins and meeting us where we are and where I am at and being able to be like, as long as you're taking a step forward, even an attempt and a try and that self-belief is really what can snowball into such a beautiful journey because the moment that you can stand at the top of the hill or the bottom and be like, I'm going to take the first step, you'll find that community that has ancestors, that energy, that power just rise up and all of a sudden, you're just being guided gently up that hill or down the hill, whichever way you're going. And so it's taking that first step, that belief, just say, I want to try. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, Dean, do you want to comment? For me, yeah, what I would say is what I see out there is um. Many people believe that, you know, no one loves me. No one cares to me. Why should I even try to do anything? Doesn't make any sense. I'm not even going to make it to 28 years old anyways. I'm going to die by the time I reach. You know, they even give themselves a time to die, you know, and feeling that way about yourself, not knowing who you are. It, it just put up this thing, this wall around them, like they, they block everything and everyone out because they feel like no one loves them. No one care for them. They don't have a purpose. They don't even have a reason to live. And that's where the friendship comes in. That's where support comes in. That's where the community comes in. That's where family comes in. 
that, that, that's where human being comes in to help others to break away all that, to let them know that you are worthy, you are worth more. You are fearfully and wonderfully made to speak into their lives so that by speaking into their lives, they can actually make a difference. And they too can have memories and testimonies and go on in society and make a difference for others who think they can't because they don't even have any reason to move forward. Living senseless or, or, or a life not on purpose, no need. So knowing that who they are and knowing that they are loved, you know, we can tear down that barrier. Knowing that they can forgive, knowing that they can bounce back, you know, it, it, it can tear it down slowly. Slowly, like removing the layers of the onion, as they, they mentioned, slowly and slowly until that person realized that I am more than I think I am. That's what I, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, we have a, a question from the, the chat and I, I have a couple more questions as well. Um, so so the question um, that Zola has posed is, is what, as a community member, um, a concerned fellow human being, um, but not necessarily somebody working in the field um, as both of you are, like how can we um, support, like what can we do to support um, uh, these, these uh, folks who are struggling? I can lead that off again. Um, I feel like the advocating, being, if you're seeing the youth, um, if you're seeing those youth or those community members there, really asking. I think that's one of the things I found in my experiences is that sometimes just sitting in silence or asking what they would like makes such a huge difference. I feel like sometimes that the community thinks they know what is needed and they are kind of told. Um, so really being open and leading them where they're at and asking them, what do you need? What do you want? And receiving that answer really without judgment. Um, but, you know, really, if you have the opportunities to volunteer, if you have the opportunities to support, if you have that knowledge, um, and, and just to even the knowledge of medicine or culture or ancestors or skill, these are all things that are so valuable. And just by being present, it's not always spoken, but the youth see that. They see that at a community event that there's 10, 15 elders that just show up and are open to questions. That makes a huge difference. So I think just being in those events is that really in presence is so important. So thank you for that question and wanting to be concerned and be involved. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's um it's great to to remind ourselves that you know there are ways that we can just connect with somebody, but just asking um, you know, what they need. Um, Wadeen, do you have any um comments on that question? Yes, I just want to say that Alex, yes, I just want to continue on what she said. She mentioned some of the points that I would mention about you know volunteering, listening. Um, we have to be aware that um, people that are struggling are not just living on the streets. Sometimes they're living in our homes, they're in our schools, they are at our church, they're all around. But just by giving someone undivided attention, that is very important. Just to even ask a person their name and have a conversation. Because a lot of times when you say, are you doing, I'm okay. That doesn't mean the person is okay. It, they, there can be a lot of things behind that person that they're thinking about even hurting themselves. And you don't know. But probably if you are just taking just one minute and have a conversation with that person, you could make a difference. Um, the need is so great in our community to serve. You know? And um, I, I, I don't think they can get 
enough people to serve because that's what we're created to do, to serve God and to serve others and to just to love God and love others and to be able to reach out to someone. It's very, it, it, it can help in such a way you would even imagine. Uh, there was a man that decided that he was gonna jump off of a bridge. This is just a story that I was told a while ago. And he wrote a letter and he said, I'm gonna walk to the bridge and I'm gonna jump off the bridge. And the only way I don't jump off that bridge is if someone says something to me. That something could be good morning, that something could be hi, how are you doing? And he walked all the way to the bridge and no one said anything. And the reason why they know this is because after he jumped off that bridge, they found the letter saying, if someone says something to me. So I'm saying in this fast paced community in these first world countries where you're moving so fast, don't even know our neighbors, don't know our friends, don't know our classmates, go to church and say hello, hallelujah, and just leave and don't know, don't speak to people. We have to slow down. We have to get time, find time to serve, find time to speak to people, find time to speak to even people in our own home, know how they're doing and find time to give your undivided attention and, and give a love. You know, know a person, love language, and find out ways and means how you can get to them and build a, a rapport so that you can get to know them and understand them and show empathy. And these are the things that we, we need in society today to be able to help others. Thank you for that question. Yeah, you know, it's wonderful um, to hear about this. Um, uh, yeah, just the the need to see connection um, that exists in all of us as humans, right? And um, sometimes it can be a simple, hello, how are you? Um, that actually is is really carries a lot of weight. Um, we have a question about the phenomenon of gender-based violence. And um, what are your thoughts on why is it still such an invisible part of our society right now? I, I can start with, with this person. Um, what I what I think, and based on some of the reading that I was doing, it it um it makes a person silent. So a lot of people don't really want to speak about what is going on. They 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 try to hide it from their friends, their families, and and a lot of people they have been abused not only physically, emotionally, in every alley they have been abused, but they just keep it into themselves and and that bring on a lot of trauma onto them. So because they're not speaking about it and, and trying to create an awareness of what's going on, they let sometimes other people feel like it, it, it's okay to be silent too, because people who are facing it are not speaking, or they're not, they're not standing up for themselves. They're, they're just there. And other people that are around them that may be going through the same thing, they're not speaking either. And it's good to say something because being able to, to bring awareness to a situation can make a difference in the lives of other people. So it's the silence that's kind of, you know, or the fear, the silence and the fear of people knowing that I've been through this, or I've been through that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that really taps into the, the silence and the fear is, is part of a, a shame, um, you know, that they they experience that they're like, why is this happening to me, I think. Um, Alex, did you want to contribute? Yeah, for sure. Um, I love what you said, Regine. That's exactly. And to add into that, unfortunately, I feel like it's not as invisible as we think. Um, I feel like if we just reach our eyes or our giving or our thoughtfulness or awareness just a little bit outside of ourselves when we enter into our communities, our grocery stores, our public events, that we will see these, we will see these situations. And so when I talk about advocating, it doesn't need to be, you know, showing up at a march or, you know, writing letters or doing emails. It can be as something as simple as acknowledging it at the grocery store, watching and being aware of happenings outside of yourself and advocating. And if you feel like you don't have that voice, connecting with that voice. 
being aware for children, being aware for men, being aware for women, and just really being aware. And that when you look for it and are you ready to, you know, commit and find that voice, there's a lot more people that want to speak up. And that is that fear of speaking up. But the more voices, it that's how change can happen. But it really starts with this internal community right where we are. Thank you. Great point. I feel like that's so important to know that we can't just um, uh, force people uh, to to be visible and to speak up and, you know, to really be um, seeing it from their perspective and what are some of the ways that they might be feeling really um, reluctant to, to say something. Um, so uh, do either of you have any resources um, for, for victims um, that we can point them to? Um, I, I know that I, I meant to share this when um, we had uh, Lisa's presentation on Cindy Blackstock. Um, so this is the link to the First Nations Child and Family and Caring Society that Cindy Blackstock um, founded. Um, but uh, do uh, either of you have any suggestions for, for resources? I think it would start to begin to ask where is the person, um, depending on where they are, those resources absolutely can be different. Um, but really, you know, looking at, um, and, and I, I guess it depends on what resource you're looking for, because there can be such a huge window. Looking at, you know, BC government websites, looking at your local community um, websites, um, I think, it, again, it's such a, such a variety, but, you know, looking, yeah, I would love to hear more of, because I have like a hundred resources on my, on my brain, but I really, love, and I'm like, where? Because, you know, but, but I mean, that would start reaching out to your community, depending on where you are. I mean, in New Westminster, there is recovery day, which is, if you don't know where to start, that happens in the fall. And there are something that I was so grateful to participate in last year. And I believe there was over 200 different avenues, different resources within Recovery Day. Um, and I literally took every single pamphlet and there was everything. <laughs> so that's a great place to start. And in the meantime, really just reaching out to your community, reaching out to your city that you live in, um, you know, Googling. So that would be, you know, reaching out even to some of your recovery centers, depending on what city you live in. So, um, yeah, it really depends on what resource you're looking for, but definitely they are out there. Thank you. I didn't know about Recovery Day. That sounds amazing. I'll have to uh, look out for that in the fall. Um, and Lucy has um, suggested a Tira Women's Resource Society, um, and their tagline is Women Empowering Women. So that also seems really fantastic. Um, committed to working uh, to, to ending violence against women. Um, Wadeen, did you have any resources that you wanted to share? Yes, um, there is a, a card called the Street Card with a lot of resources on it. But as Alex was saying about Google, I think the one of the first thing that you could do is Google um, some resources. And also there's a line called 211 that you can call to get information as well and get guidance on where to go and how to go about things. And I can't stress enough that having a friend is important. And that friend will help you along the way as well. Because although you're getting into these things, you need a friend, you need that support, you need that strong rock to keep you going and to motivate you along the way. Great point to that, um, you know, having all these resources is 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 wonderful, um, but actually having that connection still again is, um, is nothing can replace that, so. Um, okay, 
Um, I think we're going to end here um, because we are almost out of time. Um, but I, I just want to say to both of you um, and to Lisa, if she listens to this later, um, just how proud we are of you all. I mean, honestly, hearing from you today, hearing your words um, of wisdom and, and just the wealth of, um, of care and thought and um, how much knowledge you all possess. Um, and and we're, we're so happy um, that you participated in today's session, um, but are also just part of the, the Sprout Shaw uh, community. Um, you know, this is something that we um, are, are trying for the first time, um, having a, a student-led session like this, um, but I can assure you that I am going to advocate for another one because I, I've learned so much from both of you and enjoyed hearing from, from you so, so much. Um, so wonderful job today. And, um, and we're, we're so happy um, to, to have you. Um, and thank you everybody for participating. Um, I'm really grateful for your time. I know that it's uh, the end of the day. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm just really honored that um, we are able to um, commemorate Moose Hyde Campaign Day um, in, such a, in such a supportive, um, wonderful environment. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care.